Chapter One of From the Easy Chair, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume Two by George William Curtis. Chapter One The New Year. In Germany, on Sylvester Abend, the eve of St. Sylvester, the last night of the year, you shall wake and hear a chorus of voices singing hymns, like the English waits at Christmas, or the Italian Pifferari. In the deep silence, and to one awakening, the music has a penetrating and indefinable pathos, the pathos that Richter remarked in all music, and which our own Parsons has hinted delicately, quote, Strange was the music that over me stole, for twas born of old sadness that lives in my soul. End quote. There is something of the same feeling in the melody of college songs heard at a little distance on awakening in the night before commencement. The songs are familiar, but they have an appealing melancholy unknown before. Their dying cadences murmur like a muffled peal heralding the visionary procession that is passing out of the enchanted realm of youth for ever. So the voices of Sylvester's Eve chant the requiem of the year that is dead. So much more of life, of opportunity, of achievement, past. So much nearer age, decline, the mystery of the end. The music swells in rich and lingering strains. It is a moment of exaltation, of purification. The chords are dying. The hymn is ending. It ends. The voices are stilled. It is the benediction of St. Sylvester. Quote, she died and left to me the memory of what has been and never more will be. End quote. But this is the midnight refrain. The king is dead. With the earliest ray of daylight, the exulting strain begins. Live the king. The bells are ringing. The children are shouting. There are gifts and greetings, good wishes and gladness. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! It is the day of hope and a fresh beginning. Old debts shall be forgiven. Old feuds forgotten old friendships revived to-day shall be better than yesterday the good vows shall be kept a blessing shall be wrung from the fleet angel opportunity there shall be more patience more courage more faith the dreams shall become life to-day shall wed the glamour of to-morrow ring out the old ring in the new charles lamb says that no one ever regarded the first of january with indifference no one, that is to say, of the new style. But a fellow pilgrim of the old style, before Pope Gregory retrenched those ten days in October, three hundred years ago, or the British Parliament those eleven days in September, a hundred and thirty-five years ago, took no thought of the first of January. It was a date of no significance. To have mused and moralised upon that day more than upon any other, would have exposed him to the mischance against which Rufus Choate asked his daughter to defend him at the opera. Tell me, my dear, when to applaud, lest unwittingly I dilate with the wrong emotion. The Pope and the Parliament played havoc with the date of the proper annual emotion. Moreover, if a man should happen to think of it, every day is a New Year's Day. If we propose a prospect or a retrospect, we can stand tiptoe on the top of every day, yes, and of every hour in the year. Good morning is but a daily greeting of Happy New Year. But these smooth generalizations and truisms do not disturb the charm of regularly recurring times and seasons. That the 5th of October, or any day in any month, actually begins a new year, does not give to that date the significance and the feeling of the 1st of January. Our fellow pilgrim of the old style must look out for himself. He may have begun his year in March, and a blustering birth it was, but we are children of the new style, and the first of January is our new year. That is our day of remembrance, our feast of hope, the first page of our fresh calendar of good resolutions, the day of underscoring and emphasis of the swift lapse of life. A few more of them, and then whispers the mentor who is not deceived by the jolly compliments of the season and the sober significance of the whisper is plain enough ehwe postume sang the old roman 
this world and the next and all's over said airy tom lapwit to the afflicted widow the relentless punctuality the unwearied urgency of old time who turns his hourglass with such a sonorous ring on new year's day seems sometimes a little wanting in the best breeding it furnishes so unnecessary a register the slow whitening and thinning of the hair the gradual incision of wrinkles the queer antics of sight which holds the newspaper at farther and farther removed until at last it is forced to succumb to glasses the abated pace in walking the dexterous avoidance of stone walls in country rambles the harmless frauds lurking in the expressed reasons for frequent pauses in climbing a hill to turn and see the landscape frauds which the tears of my uncle toby's good angel promptly wash away the general and gradual adjustment to greater repose all these surely are adequate reminders and signs of the sovereignty of time why should he be greedy of more why thump and rattle at the door as it were on the first of january and bawl out to the whole world that we are a year older and that makes it is disagreeably unnecessary why should not the old fellow do his duty quietly and tell off another year without such an outrageous uproar does he think it so pleasant to hear his increasing tally forty five fifty five sixty five peace peace why not have it understood that the tally beyond well say fifty is a gross impertinence let something be left to the imagination besides what is the use of wigs and hair dye and padding and what not colouring and enamelling and other juvenescent procedures of the feminine arcana if annual proclamation of impertinent dates and facts is to be made the worst of it is that it is a positive interference with the just play of the fundamental truth that age is not justly measurable by the mere lapse of time some people are never young others defy age this indeed is due to temperament but that is not all those grey hairs and wrinkles that eyesight of less keenness that disinclination to leap walls and those fraudulent halts to survey the rearward landscape are enemies whose assaults are by no means regular they come at very different times to different people adolphus at sixty despises spectacles triptolemus at thirty is bald the hair of horatius at sixty-five is as affluent as hyperion's and as dark without unguence as the raven's plume let facts speak to a candid world why should that greybeard paul pry called time blare through a speaking trumpet that the brave valentine quote, as wild his thoughts and gay of wing as eden's garden bird end quote, is just as old as old toothless tottering decrepit orson every well-regulated citizen of the world is interested and more vitally interested with every closing year that upon the point of age all men shall be left to their merits and shall not be measured arbitrarily by that procrustean standard of years it is notorious that men grow wiser every year and it is observable that the more years they have the more they look without doubt and questioning upon the family record those leaves of births following the doubtful books of scripture registered with such painful and needless particularity of dates partake of the doubtfulness of their neighbourhood they are mere intercalations new books of the apocrypha yet they often cause young fellows of seventy to be accused and convicted of being old men since then we cannot stop the flight of time let him pass but he must not calumniate as he passes he must not be allowed to stigmatise vigour and health and freshness of feeling and the young heart and the agile foot as old merely because of a certain number of years this is the season of good resolutions the new year begins in a snowstorm of white vows so be it but let our whitest vow be after that for a whiter life that age shall no longer be measured by this arbitrary standard of years and that those deceitful and practical octogenarians of thirty shall not escape as young merely because they have not yet shown the strength to carry threescore and ten with jocund elasticity then happy new year shall not mean good night but good morrow End of chapter one
Chapter Two of From the Easy Chair, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume Two by George William Curtis. Chapter Two: The Public Scold. The Easy Chair was lately asked whether it thought the office of public scold an agreeable one. There was a certain tartness in the question as if its real purpose was to learn from the easy chair whether it enjoyed that position, and upon looking further it appeared that the question had been suggested by a remark of the easy chairs to the effect that a certain class of our fellow creatures seemed to be disposed to do their duty in a manner that might be improved. But what is an easy chair but a kind of censor morum? Would the kind critic of its conduct have it say to the gentleman whose hands are soiled that they are as pure in the morning? and to the tactless dame who makes all her neighbors uncomfortable that her manners are charming perhaps this is really what the critic meant for he continued by saying that it is so much better to dilate upon what is pleasant than to discuss the unpleasant aspects of life that is true it was the principle of the vicar of bray that reverend gentleman always avoided friction he was a chip of the polonius block the cloud was a camel or a whale, according to the fancy of his companion. The good vicar looked askance at Rome under Henry and Edward, and told his beads piously under Mary, and upon reflection eschewed the mass-house under Elizabeth. He dilated upon the pleasant aspects of affairs. We can imagine him saying to Ridley in the time of Mary, My dear bishop, why think yourself wiser than your time? And a little later to Parker, Elizabeth's archbishop, Ridley having been burned in the meanwhile, my dear Archbishop, Rome I see is much too stringent. The vicar of Bray was not a scold. He was, according to the abused text, all things to all men. Yet his profession, our censor must remember, was a scolding profession, at least in the sense in which the word is often used. His duty was to admonish and exhort, to adjure his flock to quit the error of their ways. Perhaps he was a poor illustration of it. Perhaps, true to his temperament rather than to his profession, instead of urging repentance because the kingdom was at hand, he was accustomed to say, Brethren, I observe that you lie and steal and slander your neighbors a good deal. But in such a world as this, what is to be expected? We are all poor, weak, fallible things. Which of us can hope to strike twelve every time? Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. We must all beware of hypocrisy, dear brethren, and of pretending to be better than our neighbors. You remember the Pharisee who thanked God that he was not as other men. Let him be a warning against the sin of presumption. There is the beautiful lesson of the beam and the moat. We must not forget it. We are all miserable sinners, and therefore we must not twit each other with sinning. We ought to tell the truth, my friends, but we don't we all lie. Let us therefore not scold each other, since we are all equally wicked. But let us avoid Phariseeism and all that assumption of superior virtue which is implied in saying to a foul-mouthed brother that he ought to speak cleanly. Beware of Phariseeism as of the impardonable sin. Scold not, dear brethren, but talk of the things which are pleasant, and instead of rebuking the liar commend his goodness to the poor, and instead of silencing the backbiter, praise his subscription to the soup kitchen. For what says Dr. Watts? Let dogs delight to bark and bite. Dogs naturally scold. But we, brethren, we have the gift of avoidance. And, O oh, liars, thieves, and slanderers, let us live together in peace and say nothing about falsehood, stealing, and calumny. This was probably the tenor of the sermons of the Vicar of Bray. And this was the way that he strove to save souls. But Fenelon and John Knox and Edwards and Whitefield and Wesley and Channing and St. Paul, each in his own way, said, Thou art the man, and rebuked both the sin and the sinner. Yet all of them were very human, and very fallible, and all came very short of the ideal of duty. To point out a defect in a picture, or to exhort the artist to avoid it, is not to declare yourself an incomparable artist. To demand honesty in public affairs is not to proclaim yourself a saint. To say that school teachers should be thorough and use their common sense as well as a textbook is not to scold them. 
Romilly was not a scold because he denounced the unjust criminal laws, nor John Howard because he rebuked the inhumanity of prisons, nor John the Baptist because he exhorted men to repent. The poets rebuke our lives by the fair ideals that they draw, but they do not scold. If a man preaches a little sermon illustrating the way in which men in a certain profession, let us say, shirk their duty, and someone cries out, Don't scold so, the preacher may safely exclaim, Fellow sinner, thou art the man. But the best illustration is closer at hand. If the easy chair reproves certain fellow sinners for remissness in doing their duty and for that offense is a scold, what is the censor who scolds the easy chair for scolding? Let us avoid Phariseeism, brethren, and the assumption of superior virtue. End of chapter 2. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 3 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 2, by George William Curtis. Chapter 3. National Nominating Convention. It was a wise newspaper that recently advised every American who could do so to see a national nominating convention. It is a spectacle visible in no other country, and the most exciting political spectacle in this. It is the arena in which the prolonged and passionate strife of countless ambitions, intrigues, interests, and conspiracies is decided. And it is the more exciting, because with every effort to predetermine the result, the result is still at the mercy of chance. The action of the convention is a lottery. Suddenly, at the decisive moment, an unexpected combination, an impulse, a whim, like an overwhelming tidal wave, sweeps away all plans and calculations, and the result is as complete as it is unanticipated. Even the device of a two-thirds vote to make a nomination valid does not avail to secure the real preference of the party which the convention represents. The two-thirds rule, as it is called, was designed to baffle the fundamental democratic principle, which is the rule of the majority. When that is abandoned, the proportion selected is purely arbitrary. It may as well be nine-tenths as two-thirds. But even such a dam will not resist the swelling waters of feeling in a convention. The French say that it is the unexpected that happens, but in a national convention it is the unforeseen which is anticipated. The palpitating multitude which has been stimulating its own excitement confronts every doubtful moment with an air which says plainly, Now it's coming. There is always a preliminary contest to various cities before the National Party Committee to decide where the convention shall be held. Local orators with honeyed persuasion dazzle the committee with statistics of the superior convenience, accommodation, beauty, healthfulness, resources, facilities, and whatever else their good genius may suggest of the city for which each one of them contends. The convention is held in the largest hall, or in a building erected for the purpose, like the wigwam in Chicago in 1860. The convention itself is composed of about 900 state delegates, their seats designated by a flag with the name of the state placed by the seat of the chairman of the delegation. The alternates are also seated. Every convention is full of distinguished leaders and members of the party, and as any of them appears, either entering or rising to speak, they are greeted with great applause. If the temporary chairman be an eminent party chief or an eloquent popular orator, his address touches the springs of emotion and arouses hearty enthusiasm. But the friends of the leading candidates deprecate the mention of names until the candidates are presented by the chosen orator. The reason is that the applause of the convention is one of the counters in the game. There are hired clacks in the conventions which keep up a humming cry which is a substitute for applause, and which is sometimes continued for a quarter of an hour. The longer the hum, the more popular the candidate. Forgetfulness or ignorance of the value of applause under such circumstances reveals the comparative popularity of candidates in the eager mass of delegates and spectators. In one convention, the permanent president and his address, but without any sinister purpose or indeed any other purpose than kindling the convention, mention successively, and of course, with impartial compliment, the name of every candidate who was known to be on the list. Involuntarily, he thus tested the feeling of the convention. The galleries also swelled the acclaim, but in the galleries the clack is shrewdly distributed. 
and in critical moments the approval or disapproval of the turbulent galleries undoubtedly impresses the delegates and recalls the galleries of the french convention a hundred years ago there are occasional skirmishes of debate upon motions or resolutions but the first great interest of the regular proceedings is the report of the platform committee it is a tradition of conventions that the platform should be accepted as reported both to gain the prestige of perfect unanimity and to escape tinkering which may lead to endless discussion and discordant feeling but when the motion is made to proceed to the nomination of candidates the excitement is intense the orators are usually carefully selected not alone as eloquent speakers but as men of weight and influence and of what at the moment is more indispensable than everything else tact the speeches are made with the fundamental understanding that however glowing and elaborate the praise of the candidate may be there shall be an explicit assurance that whatever the merits of any candidate the candidate who shall be nominated by the convention will receive the universal and enthusiastic support of the party on one occasion when this fundamental rule was forgotten by an ardent orator who in the warmth of his devotion to his candidate declared that no other man was so certain to draw out the whole party vote in the state for which he spoke a hurricane of hisses from the convention and the gallery silenced him and the friends of his candidate were instantly aware that a fatal injury had befallen him in another convention the orator who nominated one of the candidates was so exasperated by what he felt to be the treachery to his candidate of a conspicuous friend of another that his denunciation of the traitor was held to be a covert assault upon the traitor's candidate and again a tempest of universal hissing overwhelmed the luckless orator and his candidate the announcement by the states of the first formal vote for candidates is made in impressive silence followed by immense applause but the second ballot is more significant and whenever upon any ballot the announcement of a vote is seen by the tally to decide the nomination the feeling culminates in an indescribable tumult of frenzied acclamation and the convention generally adjourns to consider the vice presidency but the interest in its work is at an end and it is astounding to see the happy-go-lucky providence which presides over the selection of the officer who has thrice become the president of the united states in the history of national conventions there is no more touching incident than that of mr seward awaiting at his home in auburn the results of the balloting at the convention of eighteen sixty which nominated mr lincoln by what is called the logic of the situation mr seward's nomination was assured and no disappointment could have been greater than the selection of another how bitter it was was not suspected until his life was recently published but he encountered the shock with his usual equanimity and before the election he had made the most extraordinary series of speeches for his party which the annals of any campaign record the journal's advice was sound see a national convention if you can end of chapter three recording by philip gould chapter number four of from the easy chair volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 2, by George William Curtis. Bryant's Country. The traveller in western Massachusetts, reaching some quiet village upon the hills, which seems to him singularly lonely and remote, often finds some little incident in its annals which connects it with the great world. Coming to Goshen, a solitary little town wholly unknown to most of our readers, he is conscious of the height, of the purity of the air, and the peacefulness of the wooded landscape and far below towards the east he sees the undulating line of holyoke and on some fortunate day may catch the gleam of the placid connecticut winding through the broad meadows and between tom and holyoke to the sound the little town itself is a grassy street with a meeting-house and a hotel which has a desolate air of mistaken enterprise declining into disappointment with long anticipation of a crowd of summer pilgrims who might well turn their steps hither but who have never come beyond the village street upon the same plateau is the great goshen reservoir which lies hushed in grim repose over the town of williamsburg a few miles below 
the town which was overwhelmed some years ago by the bursting of the mill river dam such events are the tragedies of the hills which become traditions told in the village store and investing with dignity as the years pass the villagers who recall the direful day among the traditions of goshen is that of the passage of some of the soldiers of burgoyne on their march from saratoga to cambridge when the brilliant british general swept down lake champlain to the hudson capturing ticonderoga as he came it was feared in these hills that he would march triumphantly from albany to boston there was a general rally of all able-bodied men to the rescue and as they marched away from their fields ripe for the harvest the prospect was dismal until the able-bodied women marched into the fields and gathered and housed the crops the british invaders reached goshen indeed on their march from albany to boston but only as prisoners of war all this peaceful neighborhood was originally granted by the state to the heirs of soldiers in the early new england wars goshen and its neighbor chesterfield another city set upon a hill six or seven miles to the south were grants to the descendants of soldiers in the narragansett expedition of king philip's war from goshen the chesterfield meeting-house can be seen against the southern horizon and the road lies through high pastures and lonely farms to the pleasant town when you climb its hill and look around you see a cluster of hospitable houses around which the neatly kept grounds give an air of refinement to the whole village which is steeped in rural tranquillity the broad hills slope westward towards the valley of the westfield and beyond lie the shaggy sides of the cummington range chesterfield has its special tradition of lafayette passing the night in its old tavern on his way from albany to boston in eighteen twenty four it is a characteristic representative of the hill towns so still that the air seems drowsy as in rip van winkle's village but such tranquil towns in which a moving figure is half spectral and almost a surprise were the beginnings of the nation from these sequestered springs the mighty river flows chesterfield has not half the population that it counted seventy years ago the whole town now reports scarcely seven hundred persons and yet with all the old spirit it invited its neighbors in hampshire county to come and dine on one of the loveliest of summer days this year it was the annual festival of the hillside agricultural society and fully a thousand people filled the friendly town the feast was spread upon tables on a green space besides the old house in which lafayette slept and under a bower of leafy white birch boughs the magnates of the county were all present and it was whispered privately that there were private whisperings among eminent politicians who however with the non-political or the political of the wrong side talked cheerfully of the charming day and the promising crops politics is the breath of our patriotic nostrils and it was a stimulating thought that while we were listening to the humorous but well-merited praises of strawberry hill pork some of our bland companions were saving their bacon in other ways and while we dreamed of crisp sausages and savory ham were contriving senators and councillors and even a governor himself the simple courtesy and universal intelligence were of the old new england nor less so the composure and ease with which speaker after speaker mounted the bench on which he sat and in what he said and the way in which he said it showed that he was a graduate of the town meeting the pastor of goshen asked to speak of some of the more noted citizens of the neighboring towns might well have occupied with so fruitful a text all the hours until sunset but with exemplary discretion he mentioned but a few and among them some that surprised a new yorker who had not known but might have guessed that gideon lee former mayor of the city and luther bradish lieutenant governor of the state 
came from the little town upon the Cummington Hills opposite, where Bryant studied law. The whole region before us, indeed, was especially Bryant's. Upon the slope yonder he was born, and we could see the house in which as a boy he lived. Thanatopsis was the hymn of his meditations among those solitary woods. There, upon the nearer hill, high over plain field, where he wrote the poem, The Waterfowl, forever floating in the twilight heavens, far through their rosy depths dost thou pursue thy solitary way. We were looking upon the cradle of American literature. Here its first enduring poem was written. The poet himself never escaped the spell of the hills. The child was father of the man. Bryant in the city was always the grave and unchanged genius of New England. The city did not wear off the rusticity of his manner. His air was reserved and remote, and he was still wrapped in the seclusion of the hills. It is in such scenes, and among such people, on such a day, that the power of these hills and their influence upon our national life and literature are perceived these hidden springs have overflowed the prairies of the west and how much of the wealth and prosperity the energy industry and enlightenment of new york have trickled down from them you may hear if you doubt every year on forefathers day at the new england dinner in new amsterdam as there is altogether too much glory to be adequately celebrated in one day another has been added to accommodate the yankee city of brooklyn and it is not the fault of the sons of new england if on those two days the whole continent does not hear the melodious thunder of their eloquence proclaiming that new england always led is leading still and will lead forever the triumphal procession of american progress supported by such a history it is a natural boast there is however one inexorable condition to do what new england has done new england must be what she has been end of chapter four chapter five of from the easy chair volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 2, by George William Curtis. The Game of Newport. There is nothing more delightful than the gravity with which the game of Newport is played. To assist at one of the solemn functions, like a coach parade, is not unlike attendance upon a function of the ancient church in Rome. On a true Newport afternoon, as soft and sweet and luminous an air as can be breathed, Newport, in every kind of stately and comfortable and light and graceful carriage, with the finest horses and the most loftily disdainful of coachmen, proceeds down the avenue to behold the stately procession along the ocean drive of its kind there is no more beautiful drive in the world the shore winds among rocks which are massed a shrewd-eyed traveller said as on the shores of greece the bold character of the coast of rhode island and its picturesque effects are wholly unknown upon its neighbour long island the endless reach of sand and the monotony of the vast level land on Long Island have a certain vague charm, as of a seashore becoming, or about to become, picturesque. But that point is fully reached by its northern neighbors of the New England coast, and the ocean drive in Newport is in itself incomparable. For its company on the day of a great social function, it is quite as incomparable. Hyde Park, the Bois, the Cassin, the Prater, show no sumptuous display. If the street boy were a philosopher, he would say probably as he watched the spectacle, My eyes, money plays here for all it's worth. 
the american street boy of every degree is not supposed to need any stronger impression of the value of money than he already possesses but newport is the great school for that instruction and it is open free to the whole world money elsewhere has the same instincts and desires but in a city in winter its sports and effects however splendid are divided and hidden in summer newport they are concentrated under the most fortunate conditions and proceed in the open air it is all the more striking because money has built its summer city close by and just above one of the oldest and most historic of our cities it has improvised its magnificence and mad profusion upon the outskirts of simplicity and moderation are observant for all their plainness when they were asked what effect the new town produced upon the old whether the rollicking city on the hill harmed or helped the plodding seaport they answered until croesus and midas came it was beneficial but they have ruined newport perhaps not however the newport on the hill of today is the legitimate offspring of the earlier summer retreat and that was a group of the select who came to newport to enjoy themselves for the summer they were well to do some of them but not many dwelt in cottages the multitude lived in hotels they danced they dined they drove they sauntered it was the green tree it was less money enjoying itself as more money enjoys itself now the gossip the flirting the display were not of another kind they were the same as today, but the scale was more limited mrs candor mrs malaprop sir benjamin backbite and the brothers surface were already there the standards of conduct the ideals of honor were not essentially different a generation ago sir benjamin bowed and danced and supped at mrs malaprop's ball with all the gay world of that time which is now in wigs caps turbans or heaven and the next day dining with mrs candor sir benjamin told with infinite relish and to the great amusement of the table the story of his hostess's verbal trips and stumbles it did not seem to be conduct essentially base because this sparkling summer realm by the sea is like charles lamb's conception of the artificial comedy of the eighteenth century i confess for myself that with no great delinquencies to answer for i am glad for a season to take an airing beyond the diocese of the strict conscience not to live always in the precincts of the law courts but now and then for a dream while or so to imagine a world with no meddling restrictions to get into recesses whither the hunter cannot follow me secret shades of wooded ida's inmost grove while yet there was no fear of jove to take permanent lodgings beyond the diocese of the strict conscience however is a critical enterprise if you take a house in capua you must needs breathe the capuan air the magnetic rock in sinbad's story drew out the nails of the ships that ventured too near old mithridates fed on poisons until they became of a kind of nutriment as dr rappaccini fed his daughter until too late he discovered that she was doomed the greybeards who drive out to see the coach parade and recall the days before the ocean drive when the rocks beyond lily pond were a glimmering land of beulah may prattle of the golden age of newport as of a happy past in which the greybeards were born but will they seriously contend that the age of croesus and midas is not the golden age of newport while they are gossiping the coaches approach they have been through the town and are driving out by the fort road and as they appear the vast throng of carriages which have driven out to meet them pull to the side of the road to allow a free course a multitude of spectators awaiting a festal procession which at last is coming naturally suggests applause but there is profound silence 
there is no cheer for every spectator to catch up and pass on the first coach is at hand and gravely passes at a deliberate pace and the great world in carriages gravely looks on the second coach deliberately follows and is surveyed with equal gravity the next perhaps will strike a spark of applause but the next passes deliberately amid a silence profound one friend perhaps in the stately procession gravely nods to another gravely gazing from a carriage the function proceeds far out at sea the white sails flash and the summer surf breaks gently along the shore every coach rolls slowly by the moment for cheering has not yet arrived indeed it does not arrive before the pageant has passed and the reviewing carriages are turning and following on its wake it is truly a solemn function greybeard recalls nothing like it for multitude and display in the old drives on beach days along the beach in what he calls the golden age but does he doubt that old newport would have done it gladly if it could have done it if the ghost of heliogabalus haunts the village shore it is with no hope of resuming the imperial crown his court merely makes a pretty summer spectacle when the opera ends the coach and the stately equipage and the flashing splendor of busy idleness are the pageant which is kindly displayed gratis for the passengers in the omnibus for the pedestrians and the nurses they sit and stroll and stare at their ease while the gay play proceeds before their eyes nowhere more constantly than in summer newport does the remark of a little child watching the march of the soldiers recur mamma how good they are to make such a show End of chapter five chapter six of from the easy chair volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 2, by George William Curtis. Chapter 6. The Lecture Lyceum. The Utica Herald, in a pleasant article, recently recalled the Lecture Lyceum of a quarter of a century ago. It was then what is called a power. It greatly influenced public opinion. Its spirit was indicated by the reply of Wendell Phillips to an invitation which asked him his terms and his subject. He answered that for a literary lecture he should expect a hundred dollars, but he would deliver an anti-slavery address for nothing and pay his own expenses. The lecturers who were most sought at the time were almost without exception men of very strong convictions upon the great question which, however evaded and dexterously hidden, was the vital thought of the country and every successive week from november to april in the largest cities and the smallest cities along the belt of country from the kennebec through new england and new york westward through ohio and the northwest to the mississippi before thousands of the most intelligent american citizens this band of lecturers advanced like a well-ordered platoon of sharpshooters and delivered their destructive volley at what they felt to be the common enemy edward everett the monarch of the platform, as Mr. Edward Parker called him in his book upon American contemporary orators, during part of this same time was making a tour through much of the same region with his oration upon Washington, for the benefit of the fund for the purchase of Mount Vernon, and he was also writing the Mount Vernon papers for the ledger. In one of these he gave an entertaining description of a night in a sleeping car, when those itinerant bedchambers had but recently taken to the road. Mr. Everett's conservative temperament made his oration a kind of corrective of the influence of the great tendency of the Lyceum Lecture. But patriotic as his purpose undoubtedly was, his effort to stem the rapidly rising tide of public sentiment was like the protest of Governor Hutchinson and the colonial conservatives against the fervid, revolutionary appeals of Otis and Adams and Quincy. Other popular speakers of the same sympathy as that of Mr. Everett found themselves out of tune with the Lyceum audience, and were but meteors flashing across the stage, whose light was lost in the steady and increasing glow of the group of men who were identified with the great day of the Lyceum lecture. These men were not all like Wendell Phillips, 
open leaders of a specific agitation, nor were these lectures always ostensibly upon what are called public questions. But the influence of the lecturers was unmistakable. They were all men known to be in the strongest sympathy with the most advanced feeling of the agitation. It was the plain spirit and tone and drift of these lectures, an occasional allusion and the necessary application of the remarks, however general, to the actual situation, rather than any deliberate discussion of the question itself, which characterized the lyceum of that day. There was sometimes an attempted reaction against this tendency. In Philadelphia it was discovered that colored persons were not admitted to the music fund hall in which the lectures had been given. The leading lecturers instantly informed the committee that they declined to speak in the hall so long as the restriction continued. In Albany the reactionary sentiment in the Young Men's Association succeeded in electing a lecture committee which was resolved upon a purely literary course, and which would not invite the usual lecturers. The result was an independent course, under the auspices of dissatisfied members of the association, in which the rejected lecturer spoke in the largest hall in the city, and the signal triumph of the seceders lay in the immense audience which assembled, in contrast to the attenuated audience upon the regular course. The singular success of the Lyceum lecture of that time was due undoubtedly to two causes, the simultaneous appearance of a remarkable group of orators and their profound sympathy with the question which absorbed the public mind. The weekly lecture was not merely a display of oratory, not only an amusing recreation, but it brought wit and accomplishment and eloquence to strengthen the public feeling and arouse the public conscience, and to confirm the earnest spirit which was universal, and which forecast the great events and noble elevation of the public mind that followed. Emerson, Wendell Phillips, Gough, Beecher, Chapin, Star King, Theodore Parker, could of themselves carry any course of lectures, and each in his own way was thoroughly in accord with the truest American life of that time. The situation and the condition of the public mind would not have availed, indeed, without the happy chance of such orators to create the Lyceum. But with that chance the Lyceum of that day was as remarkable a continuous display of various and effective eloquence as has been ever known. If the faithful diary of any lecturer who went the grand rounds twenty-five years ago from Maine to the Mississippi could be published, it would be full of the most amusing stories. The lecturers all had them to tell, and they were all men of a singularly fine perception of humor. James T. Fields, the publisher in Boston, was the friend of all the Lyceum orators, and towards the close of his life he was himself a popular and attractive lecturer upon literary subjects. His little cell or private office in the old corner bookstore in Boston was an exchange of lecturers for that neighborhood which teemed with lyceums and no similar space has ever heard fresher stories better told, or has ever echoed with gayer laughter. It was the pleasant company in that little retreat which first heard, the day after it occurred, the tale of the belated lecturer who, hurrying from the cars in a carriage to the hall in Boston, long beyond the hour, dinnerless and with no chance to dress, opened his traveling bag and proceeded to the consternation of the lady who had taken a seat in the same carriage, and whose pardon he politely and briefly invoked, to change his collar and his coat. As he began to pull off his coat, having pulled off his collar, his amazed and terrified fellow passenger began to pull at the door and to call loudly upon the driver, who was furiously whipping his horses into a pace that increased both the noise of the carriage and the conviction of the terrified lady that she was the victim of some dreadful conspiracy, or the hapless victim of a maniac. The maniac's earnest but interjectional explanations as he proceeded in his toilet, begging his companion to be pacified as he was merely going to lecture, was an unintelligible asservation, which only made his madness more indisputable and awful in what might have befallen the poor lady if the carriage had not suddenly stopped at the hall and the lecturer in his clean collar and black coat had not begged her pardon for frightening her, with a fervor that frightened her all the more, and disappeared from the vehicle with his traveling bag, shawl, and umbrella, he was not prepared to say. But the tale as he told it the next morning, with infinite humor in Field's Corner, was received, as he ruefully admitted, with louder shouts of laughter than had greeted the brightest witticisms of his lecture. Fields is gone and his old friend and neighbor Whipple, who was one of the earliest of the noted Lyceum lecturers. The old corner in the old corner bookstore is gone, and with it have vanished many of the happy company that gathered there, not only of orators, but of famous authors. The Lyceum of the last generation is gone. 
but it is not surprising that those who recall with the Utica Herald its golden prime should cherish a kindly and regretful feeling for an institution which was so peculiarly American and which served so well the true American spirit and American life. End of chapter 6 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 7 From the Easy Chair, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis chapter seven tweed there are many persons who wonder why tweed did not evade justice by forfeiting his bail he had every chance to escape they say why did he stay his chief confederates are safe in europe where he might easily have been yet he was foolish enough to take the risk of a trial and he is imprisoned probably for the rest of his life the explanation however is very obvious he did not believe there was any risk tweed was the most striking illustration of a very common faith belief in the almighty dollar he is the victim of a most touching fidelity to the great principle which every good american will surely be the last to flout his creed was very simple it was that money would buy everything and he reposed upon his belief with the sweet security of the mussulman who sees by faith a heaven of horus certainly his confidence was not surprising he had proved his creed he had seen money work miracles he had seen himself a man of no cleverness and of no advantages rising swiftly by means of it from insignificant poverty to the control of a great party it had made him master of one of the great cities of the world it had secured for him governors legislators councils and legal and executive authorities of every kind he invested in land and judges he bought dogs and lawyers he silenced the press with a golden muzzle and money made his will law here was a man who wanted nothing that money could not buy was it strange that he had unbounded faith in it every form of virtue was to him mere affectation a more or less ingenious and tenacious strike from money if a man spoke of honesty patriotism self-respect the public welfare public opinion truth justice right tweed smiled at the fine phrases in which the auctioneer anxious to sell himself cried going going argument reason decency they were meaningless to him if an opponent held out he simply asked how much the world was a market life was a bargain he felt himself with pride to be the largest operator in his way as vanderbilt in his or stuart in his in albany he had the finest quarters at the delaven and when he came into the great dining-room at dinner-time and looked at all the tables thronged with members of the legislature and the lobby he had a benignant paternal expression as of a patriarch pleased to see his retainers happy it was a magnificent rendering of fagin and his pupils you could imagine him trotting up and down in the character of an unsuspicious old gentleman with his handkerchief hanging out of his pocket that his scholars might show their skill in prigging a wipe he knew which of that cheerful company was the artful dodger and which charlie bates and he never doubted that he could buy every man in the room if he were willing to pay the price so at the capitol where sits the legislature of a noble commonwealth of four millions of souls he moved about with an air of fat good nature like the chief shepherd of the flock if he stood at the door of the assembly looking in it is easy to fancy him saying to himself the state pays these men two or three hundred dollars for four months service i will give them better wages he did not doubt that it was a fair transaction 
what is the state it is only four millions of people he thought who are all trying to be rich struggling cheating by hook or by crook every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost to be rich these men would be fools not to take my money and he smiled his fat smile and paid liberally for all that was in market there were some papers whose price he could not ascertain which persisted in speaking ill of him and his pals if the fools did not know their own interest enough to be content with a good price say of corporation advertising they must be silenced the conceit of virtue must not be pushed too far so one day his legislature passed a bill virtually giving his judges power to imprison editors at their pleasure but virtue that is in the tweed theory of life obstinacy in holding out for a higher price mustered such a really respectable protest that the public project of coercion failed and private methods were tried tweed had no doubt that reputation could be bought as well as power peter cooper builds an institute for the education of the poor does he you mean said tweed a monument to his own glory he pays a certain number of thousands of dollars for the reputation of philanthropy and mr stewart builds a working woman's palace ah and mr astor founds a library indeed and they are benevolent gentlemen and benefactors of their kind not at all they merely invest money in a certain kind of fame that pleases their taste as fast horses and yachts and pictures please the taste of other people i will show you how tis done says the faithful believer in the dollar and he gives fifty thousand dollars to the poor just as winter is beginning let the cavillers say what they will exclaim a myriad voices that shows a good heart tweed as it were tips a wink i told you how it was done he seems to say what is there that money will not buy is it surprising that such a man did not try to evade justice justice in his view was a commodity like legislative honor like newspaper independence like the reputation of benevolence the reform movement was to him a sudden and confusing flurry in which strikers to whose terms he would not yield had somehow gained a momentary advantage he had perhaps made a mistake in not buying them at their own price success had possibly put him off his guard he was sure that if an indictment were found that would be the end of it and he had no feeling of shame his friend fisk had shown what lawyers were made of and he himself would buy lawyers and judges sheriffs and juries he knew that the one thing that in a needy and greedy world cannot fail is money he came to his first trial and the jury disagreed naturally for he had bought some of them the evidence of course moral only but it is conclusive if justice facetiously so called wanted another bout he would come up smiling there was no trick or quibble that lawyers could devise for which he had not made munificent preparation even to asserting that the judge who obstinately refused to name a price was disqualified from sitting at the trial money had never failed before it certainly would not at this last pinch but it did and the bewilderment and consternation of this simple devotee was pitiful he had but one article in his faith and that was now destroyed he had staked everything upon the certainty of the almighty dollar and he had lost but there was something not less noticeable than his unquestioning faith it was that his faith was so generally held for what gave the universal and intense interest to the tweed trial here was a common thief except in the amount of his theft 
of whose guilt nobody had any doubt against whom as the judges said the evidence was a mathematical demonstration and his conviction was hailed as a kind of national deliverance and vindication of human justice there was but one reason for this and it was the feeling that money would free him of course it was known that the judge could not be bought nor the attorney-general nor the prosecution tweed might as well have offered to buy the moral law but public knowledge ended there and in the degree of the universality of the belief that somehow by actual bribery or by legal quirk or shift or sham money would buy him off is the value of the lesson of his conviction which is the utmost power of money fails before firm sagacious and intelligent honesty there is not a saloon in new york in which tweed contempt of honourable motives is the sole faith which has not had an astonishing revelation and learned that money is not omnipotent those saloons have learned one other thing that stealing is the same crime whether it be the theft of public or private property the robin hood jollity that surrounded tweed his familiar name the boss the laughing stories that were told of him showed that he was held in very different estimation from an ordinary thief the baser newspapers evidently regarded him as the french nobleman regarded himself who was firmly convinced that the almighty would think twice before condemning such a gentleman as he so when tweed went to the tombs the same feeling attended him the officers could not believe that it was really meant so rich a man who had lived in so fine a house and had spent money so profusely should be treated as a common offender the wretch who steals a loaf to feed his starving children must have short shrift and black maria dispatches him at the earliest moment but a statesman who steals millions of dollars from the people really the law must think twice before handling him impolitely a day or two after he had been taken to jail on his way to the penitentiary the paper said as if he had been a beloved prisoner of state whom cruel governments might torture but whom the people would still honor a great many improvements have been made in his cell by his friends and it has now quite a cosy and comfortable appearance the floor is covered with a carpet of a dark green ground the walls are hung with dark green cloth and the panes in the windows opening on centre street which were cracked and broken a few days ago have been newly glazed in the centre of the room is a large round table at which the boss takes his three regular meals served up in the best manner from the prison restaurant there is a luxurious leather-covered lounge in one corner and five chairs including a large comfortable rocking chair besides these few articles of furniture are a washstand and a bookcase the prisoner is plentifully supplied with reading matter and as for creature comforts the solicitude of his friends and relatives leaves nothing to be desired except liberty crowds of people have called to see him for the past two days but none were admitted without passes from the commissioners this feeling was akin to that which inspires the proverb and the practice that all's fair at the custom house when robin hood stepped politely to the door of my lord bishop's carriage and requested him to alight under the greenwood tree and proceeded to rifle the carriage of all the treasure that his lordship was conveying he was not felt to be a common thief far from it he was the people's tax-gatherer in green he scattered with a free hand among the poor the money which the rich man could lose without feeling it nobody suffered my lord bishop was admonished that he had the poor always with him and the poor rejoiced in his involuntary largesse so the boys 
thought of tweed while the boss was king there was always money about as they said and when did robin hood himself ever bestow fifty thousand dollars in a lump upon the poor besides who could say that he was robbed the rich could not feel it and was any poor orphan defrauded by him any poor widow pinched any honest laborer burdened yes they were it was public money that he stole and what is public money it is the taxes and who pays the taxes the rich no the poor the producers they come out of the rent of the tenement house out of the price of tea and sugar and coal out of the pittance of the widow and orphan and the small wages of the laborer it was from the poor who cowered gratefully over the coal that he gave them that he stole the coal his confederate sweeney planted hyacinths in the city parks and for every flower some poor soul was pinched gay robin hood strips the baron and the poor bless him as he flings them the gold then the baron goes home to his castle and wrings teeth out of the jaws of isaac of york to force him to give money then isaac of york advances at a more ruinous rate than yesterday the interest upon the money he lends so when tweed steals from the public treasury he picks every private pocket every stroke of his hammer if he hammers stone with other thieves refreshes in the public mind these familiar truths it is humiliating that the conviction of an evident offender in the court of law should be a cause of public congratulation but on the other hand it is cheering that shameless crime entrenched in every way and defying the course of law should by that course be quietly convicted and surely punished end of chapter seven recording by john brandon chapter eight of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis chapter eight commencement it is a changed college world since nat willis's philip slingsby was the hero of many a maiden's dream and the stories of willis reflected the modest gaiety of the society of his time nahant was then a summer resort of importance and had not become as one of its denizens said in later years only cold boston willis's heroes like byron's were largely himself and it was but a thin veil that covered in them persons familiar in the society that he knew and incidents drawn from his own experience he was the college hero of his time but his scripture poems which had great vogue and were printed in all the class books and readers and his burial of arnold a young and brilliant senior at yale and his bright and blithe saturday afternoon are quite passed out of current knowledge they are not the kind of verse which is produced in college now their byronic sentimentality is not to the taste of the college club and greek letter society man of to-day and charles coldstream who looks on listlessly at the college athletic games leaves enthusiasm to the fresh and has really never read those things of willis's yet the dominant emotions of commencement this year were very much what they were when philip slingsby dared the waltz and even the more emancipated bells shuddered a little as they slid into the charmed circle youth and hope and the passion which is not all a dream are forever renewed and if the fashion changes the substance remains in the crowded church at commencement this year with the gay dresses and the flowers and the music 
and the soft summer air breathing in at the open doors and windows there are still palpitating bosoms and a colour that comes and goes and glances that meet and mingle read the language of those wandering eye-beams the heart knoweth it was nat willis yesterday in a high-collared coat and an ample cravat such as brummel wore and even d'orsay it is a quaint and a droll costume as you see it in those old fraser pictures of english authors tis sixty years since but in that guise it is you sir of to-day and if your oration is spoken to one auditor in all that lovely throng in the gallery whose heart answers pity zekel to your pitta pat do you think that the divine una's grandmother was never young and that the droll high-collared coats did not cover hearts as sensitive and hopes as high as the faultless summer attire of nameless june class of ninety the actors change but the spectacle is the same even the members of the reverend and venable the corporation those bald and white-haired worthies who seem vaguely always to have been sitting unchanged in the front pews like those austere senators of rome of whom the tradition tells us that they sat motionless although the invader came even they are living monuments and on their hearts as on tablets the story of the wandering eye-beams is engraved there is not one of the young heroes of the commencement hour whom those elders do not scan with knowledge these wise young judges carry no secrets which the elders do not share is it a strange world that of willis and his philip slingsby it is the world of the moment and of this commencement but there is something else in commencement besides this romance of feeling and tradition it is the celebration of the intellectual life the eloquence indeed is sometimes rather copious an oration in the morning before one literary society in the afternoon before another and a sermon in the evening before the missionary association is good measure heaped up and running over there is some jealousy also even in academic groves in the older day if the melpomene had its oration in the morning and the euterpe in the afternoon and you read on the following sunday scrawled on the blank page of the hymn-book in the pew words 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 oration of cicero and genius eloquence common sense oration of demosthenes you knew that you read the comment upon the rival orator of a melpomenian or a euterpean as the case might be but if the orator were not always wise or eloquent there were also discourses which have profoundly influenced the lives of those who heard and read them giving a direction and inspiring a fidelity which like wordsworth's thoughts of his past years breed perpetual benediction it is a recollection blended of many feelings that which the recurring commencement brings to the alumnus but the deep and permanent charm is the consciousness of the infinite worth and consolation of letters theoretically the college course was a series of years devoted to making acquaintance with the treasures of human genius possibly there was in fact some divergence from the theory but that was the opportunity the gates were set ajar and if the neophyte did not choose to enter he lost as the teacher said to his pupil who went fishing rather than to hear webster's eulogy on adams and jefferson he lost what he can never regain is there some fatality which makes the pen the treats of commencement oratory and didactic is there some secret charm which still allies the college to the pulpit so that to talk about it is presently to begin to preach the easy chair asks because it feels that it is about to take the sacerdotal tone and remind the youth who is leaving or entering college 
that like every other epoch in life college is an opportunity it is what you make it fate as the older times would have said life as we prefer to say gives us a chance but the improvement of it we give ourselves the tragedy of the refrain too late too late ye cannot enter now is that of the man who in our simple phrase wasted his college years the tender spell of what hears maud muller lies in its saddest words of tongue or pen but the memory of what might have been is so profoundly pathetic because it might not have been and we were the arbiters of fate and did not choose to turn upward kind sir of the college who lend to the preacher of the moment your listening ear the preacher himself may be a wearisome chaplain but you are the young judge of the summer afternoon smelling the meadows sweet with hay and stopping at the cool spring where maud muller hands you the refreshing draught do you follow the allegory and see in that maid what really she is to you she's a maiden who rakes the hay to numa she is egeria by the other fountain it is a sweet illusion for the maid is not egeria nor maud muller but under those gentle forms she is the nymph of opportunity woo her and win her and all the happiness that might have been will be yours there is nothing more touching than the inability of the chooser to comprehend the choice why did not the judge yield to the soft persuasion of that simple loveliness why did he not embrace the opportunity and fold his happiness to his heart well sir that is always the question but if he did not know that in that fair figure opportunity stood before him you do know it don't be satisfied to hum in court an old love tune you remember the legend of the sibyl's books was it interpreted to you in the classroom do you interpret it to yourself the most inspiring tradition in every college is not that of the boat or the ball of copious gold and flowing wine of milo or sardanapalus or midas it is not that of the dig or the prig of dry as dust or casaban but it is that of the youth by whatever name he is called in your college who did not like the judge closing his heart ride on who knew that four such years as yours in college would never return and that they offered him the golden keys which polished by his labor would open the heaped treasures of genius in all ages and lands it is he who in taking the keys did not grudge the labor and to whose life those treasures have been wide open no the inspiring personal tradition of college was not the pleasant philip slingsby it was rather philip sidney who rode with the best and was a man in every manly enterprise but who had so used his opportunities in study and affairs that hubert languet most accomplished of scholars called him friend and william of orange called him master end of chapter eight recording by john brandon chapter nine of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis chapter nine the streets of new york even the pan americans protest that the streets of new york are dirty it is very comical but it is true that all our marvellous prosperity our genius of invention our quickness of wit and profusion of resource all our patriotism and pride 
our great traditions of liberty and heroism our free soil free speech and free press and all the force and intelligence of our free government cannot keep the streets of new york clean miss edwards the most courteous and friendly of visitors is compelled to say i found on all sides nothing but holes of mud gutters and dirt piles and endless rush and a block of street traffic there are so many dangers and the state of the highways is such as to make it incomprehensible to english people that enterprising americans would long endure it miss edwards is familiar with the dirt of egypt which is universal and intolerable but even that does not mollify or alleviate the awful impression of dirty new york then a pan-american perhaps from bogota from calao from lima from santiago from buenos aires from rio de janeiro from guayaquil cities in which we had not supposed impeccable highways to be politely flagellates us and ignominiously discrowns broadway it was impossible not to notice the deplorable condition of the streets our carriages plunged terribly into the holes which at frequent intervals were met with and the wheels at every turn sent whirls of mud which compelled the passers-by to keep at a respectful distance we may indeed reply that this is the fling of a pan-american and who forsooth is a pan-american is he the superior nay does he presume to be the peer of a north american are we not notoriously the greatest nation in the world does not our population reduplicate incalculably have we not carried civilization from sea to sea have we not the largest lakes the longest rivers the broadest prairies the greatest cataract in the world and shall the minions of monarchies and the pygmies of tuppenny temporary republics snap their ridiculous fingers at us and presume to say that the streets of new york are dirty the idea is preposterous it is contemptible moreover it is insulting and the streets of new york are it is plain sailing or slipping as chance may determine whether we go in the water or the mud so far but it is a little difficult to end that sentence in the same key let us try another possibly a little less perfervid the population of the united states is some sixty millions taken all together they form undoubtedly the most intelligent community with the highest average well-being in the world they are self-governing down to aldermen and coroners more than in any country at any time in history the will of the majority of the adult male population determines the government the city of new york is one of the three or four chief cities of the world it is confessedly the metropolis of this blessed and absolutely self-governing country and the streets of new york can't be kept clean is there any possible method of describing the unquestionable greatness and undoubted glory of the country its resplendent history and its miraculous achievements in an ascending and cumulative series of epithets and epigrams which shall end truthfully in the resounding allegation and the streets of new york are kept clean indeed is not this little joker worse than that of the thimble does he not grin at us from every pile of mud and laugh out of every hole and snicker and sneer on every side of the unremoved and apparently irremovable dirt and disorder it is absurd as the boys say to blame the situation upon somebody else some street commissioner or scavenger or other officer or employee nobody is ever guilty of misrule in this country but the rulers and the rulers are the people the citizens of new york elect the city officers who are to do the city work which the citizens pay for they give some of those officers authority to dismiss others who are derelict in their duty and the governor can deal with the chief officers who do not obey the command of the people if the taxes are outrageously heavy if the money is squandered if the streets are dirty and city government a farce nobody is to blame but the citizens they have as good a government as they choose and the kind of government they desire then they desire dirty streets certainly that is to say they don't desire clean streets strongly enough to secure them then popular government has failed in cities 
rather there are some things in cities in which popular government is not especially interested if there are two hundred and fifty thousand voters in the city of new york how many of them really care enough for clean streets and proper municipal administration to spend time and trouble to secure them consider the lilies of the field that is to say look at the aldermen and the municipal officers the representatives in the state legislature and in congress that the city of new york elects do they represent what we call its intelligence and character yet undeniably they are representatives of the majority of the voters and if that majority be corrupt or stupid it is either because there are more knaves and fools than intelligent and honest citizens among the voters or because such citizens do not care to take the trouble to vote and to be represented in which case the aldermen and company that we see are morally speaking true representatives of the city the minions of monarchies and the pygmies of tuppenny temporary republics as they bump and wallow and flounder be spattered and contemptuous through the streets of new york may truly say that they are such streets as the citizens desire because if the people desired clean streets unless popular government be a failure they would have them if the mayor did not appoint officers who would clean the streets they would require the governor to deal with the mayor does it necessarily follow because popular government is upon the whole the best government that the governing people desire all good things that government can supply liberty they want and equality and fair play but do they because they are self-governing desire beautiful buildings and clean streets might not a good-natured despot of fine taste and sanitary enlightenment and a sense of order give his dominions nobler public works and a better municipal administration than a republic which is neither tuppenny nor temporary but in which there is easy and indolent indifference to public beauty and public order above all said the english bishop to the young catechumen don't mistake zeal for knowledge above all says the good genius of america don't confound national bumptiousness with patriotism end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of From the Easy Chair, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume Two by George William Curtis. Chapter Ten The Morality of Dancing. The gravity of the discussion of the morality of dancing is exceedingly amusing the dancing of young people is as natural and instinctive as their laughing and singing and the old easy chairs about the wall might as wisely quarrel with the song of the bobolink in the fields as with the dance upon the floor but the grave censors who condemn it must be heard there is reason in the way in which they often put their objections excitement late hours exposure of health all these are bad but on the other hand exercise cheerfulness friendly conversation all these are good the zealous censors confound uses and abuses the easy chair has seen a worthy temperance apostle engulfing cups of coffee in the pauses of an exhortation to abstinence until it marveled at the capacity of the apostolic stomach could there be no intemperance in coffee drinking but was coffee not to be drunk the easy chair has seen such frantic gobbling at a railway eating room that it could only gaze in wonder at the sottish and so to speak drunken eating but is food not to be eaten the easy chair has seen little children extravagantly dressed and decorated dancing in great hotel parlors on hot summer nights at an hour when they should all have been sound asleep in their beds while their parents should have been soundly chastised for not putting them there but is the dancing of young persons therefore wrong this is probably to the sensorial mind nothing but the base compromise and sophistry of moderate drinking but nevertheless most of the evils of this kind are perversions of good things there are a great many young and ignorant parents who become impatient with the incessant activity and restlessness of their children they condemn them to sit still in a chair and make no noise 
dear madam it is nature's intention that the child shall be restless to develop his limbs you apply to him rules that are fit and easy for us who are old and whom nature equally admonishes to sit still in chairs our little procrustean beds are merely furniture that tortures the desire of youth for enjoyment is as worthy as its desire for knowledge for truth for excellence and it is the spirit not the method of enjoyments which are not obviously wrong that is chiefly to be regarded a good man asks whether he could go from dancing to console a dying bed but could he go from skating or reading pickwick or from heartily laughing to console a dying friend would it not even in his own view depend wholly upon the mood in which he was doing it let him select an act which he would approve let him be reading a serious book or thinking in his study or going upon a visit of charity when he is summoned and he would say that he could go with perfect composure and the utmost propriety but how if he were peevish as he read the serious book or if he were thinking angrily in his study or if he were mentally reproaching the duty that drew him from his comfortable room to pay a visit of charity could he then more properly hasten to console the dying than if he had been cheerfully dancing his mind full of pleasant thoughts and the delight of the music and the measured movement it is not the thing that he is doing but the spirit in which he is doing it that should be considered how different a view of the pleasant recreation of dancing may be taken by an intellectual man from that of one who thinks the waltz a device of satan is shown by a passage of de quincey the beginning of which the easy chair will quote and which will find an echo in many a memory and in itself of all the scenes which this world offers none is to me so profoundly interesting none i say deliberately so affecting as the spectacle of men and women floating through the mazes of a dance under these conditions however that the music shall be rich and festal the execution of the dancers perfect and the dance itself of a character to admit a free fluent and continuous action and whenever the music happens not to be of a light trivial character but charged with the spirit of festal pleasure and the performers in the dance so far skilful as to betray no awkwardness verging on the ludicrous i believe that many persons feel as i feel in such circumstances viz derived from the spectacle the very grandest form of passionate sadness which can belong to any spectacle whatsoever end of chapter ten recording by philip gould chapter eleven of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis chapter eleven the hog family it is a good sign of the times that the crusade against the large and omnipresent family of hog which the easy chair long ago preached has been vigorously renewed public manners are a common interest the private conduct of the most famous personages is of small concern beyond their domestic circle but the conduct of the person in the next room at a hotel or in the next seat in a railway car is of great interest to us yet the remedy is not obvious even if we should propose a school of manners it is not certain that the pupils for whom it would be especially designed would attend if a fellow guest at the grand hotel of the universe comes in at two in the morning and going humming along the corridor to his room flings his boot down upon the floor at his door with a resounding blow that awakens all neighboring sleepers you may cover him with expletives and consign him in imagination to a hundred direful dooms but nevertheless he goes unpunished or you may suddenly confront him in all the majesty of nocturnal dishabille and admonish him severely of the wicked selfishness of his ways but the probability is that you will have either an extremely amused audience who will guy your appearance without mercy or receive a surly rejoinder in the form of a boot 
or a volley of vituperation in any event the school of manners will not be honored by the exercises yet the hogg family is not american nor is it by any means peculiar to this country the lady mavornine who said with enthusiasm that she could travel without insult from the atlantic to the pacific and that every american of the other sex seemed to make himself her protector said only what is generally true of the american he is naturally courteous and invincibly good-natured indeed it is his good nature which has permitted the family hog to develop to such proportions a man enters a hotel as if it belonged to him will he not be forced to pay for his accommodation and roundly shall he not take his ease in his inn is he not willing to settle for all the food drink comfort trouble that he may require on occasion shall he put himself out for others if number one does not look out for itself who will look out for it and to all this jonathan good-naturedly assents if number one takes more than his share of the sofa jonathan moves up if number one puts his feet on a chair jonathan does not stare if number one still more grossly demonstrates his poor kind lineage jonathan dislikes to make trouble until number one comes to despise those whom he insults and plainly expects every circle to bow to the sovereignty of selfishness this is a fatal form of good nature but it has a not unkindly origin it springs from a social condition in which everybody is expected to help everybody else because everybody needs help as in a frontier community indeed in many a rural neighborhood still this spirit of lending a hand is supreme everybody expects to submit to inconvenience because he knows that he will require others to submit but these refinements of mutual dependence must not be allowed to justify the outrages of selfishness the passenger in the boat or the train who occupies more than his seat who sits in one chair covers another with his feet and a third with his bundles and smokes and widely squirts tobacco juice around him until his vicinity is not a little heaven but another kind of h below is a public pest and general nuisance for whose punishment there should be a common law of procedure but this can be found only where there is a common contempt and resolution which will deprive him of his ill-gotten seats in the first place and make him feel in the second the general scorn of his neighbors but as we are told constantly and correctly that we are a reading people it is through reading that the members of the family which is hostis humani generis will learn that they are the most detestable and detested of the great families of the race you sir whose eyes are skimming this page and who never give your seat to a woman in the elevated car on principle the principle being either that a woman ought not to get into a crowded car knowing that she will put gentlemen to inconvenience or that the company ought to forbid the entry of more passengers than there are seats or that first come should be first served or that number one having paid for a seat has a right to occupy it or whatever other form the principal may assume you are one of the hosts against whom the crusade is pushed thou art the well for the sake of euphony we will say man but it is not man that is in the mind of your censors or you madam who enters the railroad car with an air of right and a look of reproval at every man who does not spring to his feet and who settle yourself into the seat offered you without the least recognition of the courtesy that offers it for you it would be well if the urbane mentor of another day were still here who having given his seat to a dashing young woman who seemed unconscious of his presence 
looked at her until she impatiently demanded if he wanted anything and he responding said blandly yes madam i want to hear you say thank you both this sir and madam may learn from the daily newspapers as from this page that even in a car where they recognize no acquaintance a cloud of witnesses around hold them in full survey and whatever the fashion or richness of their garments and however supercilious their air perceive at once whether they belong to the family of ladies and gentlemen or to that of charles lamb's mr h thackeray's hero could not have been more aghast to see his divine otilia consume with gusto the oysters which were no longer fresh than romeo to learn by his juliet's question to that urbane mentor of other years that his mistress must be of kin to the unmentionable family the next time those boots are flung down in the reverberating hotel corridor there will be no harm in remarking to the clerk the next morning in the crowded office that it is not necessary for you to look upon the register to know that one of the hog family arrived during the night end of chapter eleven recording by john brandon chapter twelve of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis chapter twelve the enlightened observer the enlightened observer from europe who is studying american institutions asked the easy chair the other day what was meant by the statement that a candidate for a high elective office had opened headquarters in the neighborhood of a nominating convention the enlightened observer said that he had always supposed that such conventions were assemblies which nominated persons whose public services and personal ability and character had distinguished them among their fellow citizens and shown them to be especially fitted for the offices which were to be filled am i mistaken he asked in supposing that to be the theory of your institutions the easy chair could not say that he was and conceded that such was the theory in other words continued the enlightened observer a republic secures good government because it entrusts the government not to the chance of birth which may give to oliver cromwell a son richard and make the heir of alexander the great and alexander the little but because it calls to its great offices of every degree those citizens who have demonstrated their peculiar fitness this is certainly the theory of our republican institutions returned the easy chair well said the enlightened observer well echoed the easy chair yes but why then does a candidate open headquarters yes certainly why that is it is to make himself known but the theory seems to assume that he is known already is it that he performs public services at the headquarters or exhibits there his character and abilities is not the time a little limited and the space somewhat inconvenient for such demonstrations i am at a little loss i can see that the personal appearance and manners of a candidate might be displayed favorably at a headquarters and that in a charming phrase of your country he might dispense a generous hospitality in a hotel parlor but how can he display his fitness for a high office in such narrow quarters as headquarters must be am i to understand that when mr john jay was selected as candidate for the governorship of new york he had repaired previously to the place of nomination and had opened headquarters did general washington pursue a similar course if the services and character 
of a candidate have commended him to public favor and designated him as a suitable officer why is not that enough undoubtedly answered the easy chair why isn't it but i'm afraid you have not pursued your enlightened observations quite far enough or you would have learned that in this country a kind providence is supposed to help those who help themselves and that those who expect to have governorships and senatorships and other large and highly flavored political morsels offered to them on golden salvers and on bended knees will be seriously disappointed i see said courteously the enlightened observer that my excellent friend the easy chair is pleased to speak in metaphor if i may penetrate it he is declaring that great places are to be won like precious prizes and do not drop into idle hands like fruit overripe but if i may hold him to the point is it not the theory of your institutions that it is services and character and ability that win the precious political prizes and surely such qualities and services cannot be described as idle hands i agree that providence helps those who help themselves but who helps himself more than he who helps the entire community and how does he help the community who opens headquarters to secure a prize for himself moreover have i not heard that office should pursue the man and not the man the office yet what is opening headquarters but pursuing office as a hound a hare the easy chair was obliged to suggest that there was no harm in knowing the boys and in showing the affability of a simple citizen without airs and making the acquaintance of important political personages all of which the enlightened observer conceded but still politely insisted that knowing the boys and showing affability and refraining from lofty demeanor did not demonstrate fitness for great place and was a loss of proper personal dignity that ought not to be required of any one who had really approved himself as a suitable officer he concluded that he might not have mistaken the theory but he had certainly not apprehended the practice of our institutions but surely said the easy chair tis but a small price to pay true said the enlightened observer it is a very small price but i had not supposed that in the republic office was sold at any price i thought that the good santa claus of public approval dropped it as a christmas gift into the stocking of the most deserving it seems however to be rather a raisin and snapdragon the prize of the toughest fingers End of chapter 12 Recording by John Brandon